Hello and welcome to another episode here at the, the Dogman Vortex podcast under the West Coast Dogman Project. I'm your host, Shane Michael Crisp, and tonight we have the one and only Kenny Thibodeau. Kenny, how are you doing today, brother? Not too bad. How are you doing, Shane? Doing great. Hey, sorry, I got off work a little late and rushed home to try to get everything set up and and send you the link. I, I should have sent it last night, but I like I said, I was trying to work on the intro and everything and... How last, dare you, last minute how, stuff. How you know? dare you work and have a family? What the? Heck? I know, right? <laughs> I should be just diving in dog man twenty four seven. More like twenty, I'd say twenty hours out of the day. But no, I'm hey. honored to have you on, brother, and welcome to the NADP. Thank you, I appreciate it, and I definitely am very honored to be here as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have Todd. He's my co-host on tonight. He was out of town. So unfortunately, he couldn't join us. He'll be on the next interview for sure. So I just want to let people know that are asking or wondering, where's Todd? Sounds <laughs> good. probably play a game. When Todd goes on vacation, where's Todd? <laughs> <laughs> we'll Who can sure guess it right? Gets a free shirt or get a free hat, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's but cool. hey, uh, Kenny, for the people that aren't familiar with you, can you give us a little brief bio background on yourself? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um I used to be a former actor and model, um, so I've always kind of been creative, but I uh, had some injuries from when I used to um, play some semi-pro soccer in my younger years, so I just uh, caught up to me for a little bit. I'm feeling much better now, but um, I don't know. I kind of lost some opportunities because of that because I couldn't travel as much, Yeah, um, which, is, which is actually, in reality, was a great thing because... I didn't really ever meet too many genuine individuals in that industry. So um, after that, I kind of just had to reevaluate a little bit what I wanted to do. And I knew I still wanted to be creative, um, mm -hmm. but I knew that I didn't necessarily want to travel and have to go film something. I don't know, for like a month. Yeah, it just wasn't yeah. reasonable at the time. So I got into graphics design and videography and uh, I started working for a sports doctor. And I was doing like all his media for him, um, his YouTube, just running everything. And from there, um, just by like coordinating and reaching out on social media, um, I, like a bunch of the autographs behind me are people and celebrities that I've interacted with. So, oh wow, um, yeah, Takashi Six Nine actually, which is off topic, but since you asked, uh, is just a rapper I've worked for. So he mm -hmm. was one of the main people that helped kind of give me a platform, I guess, to show my artwork, but. Um, yeah, so I, that's what I'm doing at the moment, but I've always had an interest. Um, I'm a man of science, so I like to think that when I form an opinion about something or I'm going to like look into something, I always mm -hmm. try to subjectively and objectively look at the situation. Um, because I remember growing up, uh, one of my cousins became a police officer and he was telling me there's always three sides to a story. Uh, mm -hmm. yours, theirs, and the truth. So I've always tried to keep, you know, that type of mentality when I look at stuff and realize, I don't know, if I'm going to invest some sort of time, I'd like to see some sort of scientific um, evidence. So um, to me, you know, when you have people that have credibility talking, that, that's good. But then when you actually have uh, DNA that's been left behind, or even when they're trying to push it under the rug, they admit it's unknown canid. Um, you have scratch marks that people have seen, you know, and taken the images of that look like there's an articulated thumb. When mm -hmm. you start seeing things like that, that kind of falls in the category of science, in my opinion, uh, where you actually have some sort of evidence where it's not just hearsay at that point in time. So um, for the past five years, I've been super interested uh, in that topic. Um, growing up, Sasquatch and Bigfoot was, I wouldn't say taboo but still kind of not really spoken about, but in the mm. last 10 or 15 years, there's been some great people um, that have really put like out documentaries and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not really looked upon as a joke like it used to, I guess. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it's got some credibility, which is cool, but mm. it started out the same way as um, a lot of these encounters people are having with just footprints and um, actual verbal communications before any sort of, uh, I guess, scientific member that's considered credible would take a look at it you know exactly yeah no and i think that that's awesome and though how you, you said you like to look at it from three different points i thought that was really really good to be almost open-minded to the whole 
phenomenon, the theory behind it. Um, real quick, before we jump in, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone that's in the comments tonight before we yeah. jump into this. Just want to say hi to Al, Al Santariga. He's also known as a Squatch Father out of New York. Good old Al Santariga. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for uh, stopping in and thanks for throwing off some chats. Yeah, for sure. Carrie Tucson. Hello, Dogman crew. That'd be also known as my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Oh, we got the Cricket Huntress and Ed Jessica Jones. Hey, good to see you. Let's see who else is on. Brown Dwarf is on. Yes, sir. Trippy. Good to see you, brother. Uh, Juan Reese, he's on. From Fresno, California. So he's only two hours north of where I'm at. Gerald over at Midnight or Midwest Night Watchers. Great guy, man. He's a great guy. Him and his wife, Jane. Yeah, it looks like uh, Daniel Williams. He's one of our field investigators out here in Region 1 for the NADP. And yeah, also, I spoke to him a few times. Yep, yep. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. So that was cool, man. Everyone's communicating and, you know, yeah, no, community's good, vibing. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see. Ant Rocks. What's up, Anthony? Good to see you, brother. Thanks for joining. Dreamers Nightmare or Mightmare. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. But yeah, brother, I'm excited to dive in down this vortex with you. I'm not going to call it a rabbit hole. I'm going to call it the Dogman Vortex. That's what our podcast name is. So whatever vortex you want to jump down, we'll start from there. Uh, first question, though. what? Uh, before we actually start, I wanted to say you said you're you know, a big, you worked for Takashi 69. I love listening to Takashi. I get down listening to Takashi. <laughs> so love That's the guy. Cool. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I... I've worked for a lot of people. I've done some stuff for like Taylor Swift, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, I'm very oh, open. Oh, right on. Yeah, I'm very open-minded with my music. He's just one of the people, mm -hmm. I guess, that got me a, I wouldn't say a larger clientele basis, but just people that were in the same genre he was and trying to like come up and about. He just gave me a pretty good push, I guess. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean. No, that's really cool, though. I, I like that. And you also, I've noticed you've got talent. I've only been talking to you for about, what, a week or two? Uh, and I've seen what you've done with your videography and man, you've got a talent for sure. And you definitely got an artistic eye. I've seen your graphics. I've seen Star Fox media on YouTube and your platform, man, you do have a really good eye for that. And I like to say, man, you keep putting out good stuff and it's awesome. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, whenever I try to create something, um, again, I always try to keep in mind that you I'm trying to put myself in the mind of the viewer. So mm -hmm. let's start with a photo, for example. A photo can't speak really. I mean, you can add music to it, but let, we're just talking about a photo. So when yeah. I create, yeah, when I create an image, I can add some some verbiage on there, which will give it a little bit of the feel. But you're really trying to create something that's speaking the message to your audience. So whether it's a dog man piece of art or a mm -hmm. logo for a company or um, just a brochure for you know a science program you're trying to create something that is projecting a message. Mm -hmm. um, so same thing with the videography part. Um, no one's ever going to be happy with some of the music you choose. If you're doing tribute videos, you're always going to. That's uh, true. That's fair. Yeah. You know, someone's <laughs> always going to be like, oh, this song would have been better. But again, uh, visually, I'm just trying to really tell a story from like start yeah. to end. And when clientele or, or even tribute videos I do myself, uh, I try to have that start middle and finish where it just really translates well and actually comes out so that the end product tells that story that you and the client are looking for. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And I think that's, you got an awesome talent and a, a creative eye. So, you know, like I said, man, keep up the great work that you do. Thank so you, I appreciate whenever it, you're man. ready to jump down this vortex, brother, <laughs> let's uh, first question. What got you into the dog man? And when did you first hear about the dog man? So um, to be honest with you, like, like I said, growing up, Bigfoot was, uh, man, I was like six years old and I, and I was trying to tell my mom that I wanted to go be a field researcher because it was, it started to be pretty big. I, I can't remember what website it was, uh, mm. but they were offering uh, tours and uh, out to the Pacific Northwest and, and, and the forest looked so cool and that you could pay to go with these explorers and researchers. And my mom kind of was like, yeah, you realize that's costing money that they're not really... <laughs> 
necessarily getting paid to do this correct and i'm a little kid so i didn't process that necessarily yeah but um i thought that was super cool and if you want to even rewind further than that when i was super little mini me i was i mean dinosaurs are still cool but i was really big into dinosaurs and sharks and uh Mm -hmm. i remember my parents saying i could just name off facts about sharks and dinosaurs that were ridiculous so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I I always kind of just had that. I wouldn't call those the unknown, but just just things that are are cool, I guess. I mean, there's a better word to use than that. But oh yeah, but still. So it always got me kind of into that. But then as I uh, progressed a little bit, I'd say about four or five years ago, um, I happened to come across uh, Jody Cook stuff with the North American Dogman Project, and I was mm-hmm. like. Hmm. Okay. So at first, you know, again, I try to be scientific about stuff. So I'm like, all right, well, what's this about? And then I start reading the history and stuff and I start kind of piecing things together with like Native American lore now. And like, uh, you know, like I I'd mentioned some, you know, Celtic lore and stuff. So I'm like, okay, interesting. So it's not like it's, I mean, everyone's got different views, but it's not like someone right here is trying to tell me this is a five-headed dragon out back in, uh, you know, <laughs> right. Rain's forest or something. It, there's, there's some, yeah. there's actually some credibility because when you hear Native Americans speak of things, I mean, a lot of people like to discredit our ancestors uh, for lack of technology, but I mean, they're they understood magnetic poles and things like that way better than we did. Uh, natives were able to live off. Uh, the land create medications from plants i mean they knew what they knew what they saw they knew what a bear was then they, they exactly. know what eagles and salmons are i mean they created totem poles with these animals that we know exist but then there would be a sasquatch on there so you you got to take into consideration that these people actually live out in the wilderness and you and i um for the most part or society we're not really out there so mm-hmm. Um, when you look at like a state like Maine, 90% of this is still forest. So people aren't out there consistently all the time, every second in this huge range of forest. So when I was looking at Jody's stuff, I was like, dude, this is super, super cool, but pretty, pretty creepy. And previous to that, I had heard some uh, creepy pasta type stuff. Like I had mentioned to you, um, Yes. I had heard some stuff about like I had heard dogman encounters because that's been floating around for about eight years or so. Um, but mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't really know much about uh, Vic besides what what his YouTube thread was. I couldn't really find any sort of history and stuff. So I was I was kind of taking that as a grain of salt, I guess. Um, his you know his program, but I, I was listening and, and definitely finding it interesting. But um, when I started to come across in my opinion, you know, something like uh, Jody was putting together, it was pretty, pretty well put together. And you actually had people that were specializing in certain aspects that were being involved. So I was like, okay, this is actually becoming credible. So I started paying attention more to it. And then Mm -hmm. what really kind of got me um floating like i said so about the past like five years i've been diving into this and and the ldl thing uh really really was interesting to me um that kind of got me paying a little bit more attention but i will say i think he dropped it about three years ago now mr ballin when he put out the palmyra wolves yes I i was like okay so i actually hadn't really personally um i I don't know maine's kind of a reserved (laughs) reserved state and stuff so i'd assume when people speak about other areas where people don't like to talk about openly Mm -hmm. about things like that i could see what they're saying i guess um because you know some people up here could not want to be considered crazy because things are a little bit more old time i guess but so I don't know. I personally hadn't really heard about that story. I had heard about things all across the other co- the country. Like I said, the LDL, the Michigan dog, man, the beast of Bray road. So, I mean, I, I knew like the, the bigger things, but when Mr. Baum put that out, I was like, okay, I, I already watched a bunch of his stuff. And I mean, I fact checked him. He, he's, he's pretty credible, dude. Like the things he does and stuff. So puts out his research. He does his research. Yes. Yes. So after I watched that, I ended up um, watching some other things about it too. And correct me if I'm wrong. Was it paranormal um, catalogs or paranormal? Um, oh, shoot. There was like a show. It, it's like 
they reenact. I know what show you're talking about. I can't think of it off the top of yes. my head, but they did a documentary on it. Yeah, so I, so I watched that as well, and obviously mm. they they're they're trying to be visual and stuff. But what I really liked about the Mister Ballin aspect is uh, he's just telling it to you, and you're picturing, I guess, what's occurring. And I mean, for the most part, if you follow the Dog Man phenomenon, you have an idea as to what it looks like. And as he's mm. describing it, it just gives you that creepy feel. The only example I can give you, it would be great, is. Um, like old horror movies, for example, only the first one really, but like Jaws, um, you see the shark a little bit, man, but they, you know, what's going on, but it's more of a, oh crap, dude, like aliens too. Same thing. But now yeah, exactly with newer, with newer horror movies and stuff like you, you get all the special effects and glam and stuff like that, I guess. So the paranormal one was done up a little bit more, which is still super cool, dude, but it didn't have that in my opinion, that actual shock value that the Mr. Ballin aspect had because of, like you said, how he translates and really tells his stories. Mm -hmm. So um, after that, I started like looking around and digging around it in the New England region, but I really wanted to try to specialize in Maine and see what was kind of floating around. So, Oh, for sure. I started digging up stuff and storing it in my head. But once I started communicating with you, when you reached out to me, I was like, all right, well, I hope I am always going to be sane and be able to speak, but there might be a day that I can't. So I might as well document while I'm sharp still and put everything on file, everything I know from people I've been talking about and, and, and like verifying and stuff and actually put yeah, that for sure. into a file, which is what I sent you. So it's something that I, can I know it is actually really good. 10 page what, what you wrote up the history of the dog man. And then what you specialize in certain areas of what you did. And like I said, it, Jody actually really liked it himself. So cool. Thank you. I, no, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's the big thing for me is it's a lot of the, I mean, YouTube's great, but you got to be careful. Cause like I said, there's a lot of creepy pastas, but when I'm actually exactly able to sit down and speak to somebody or look through like the news articles and, and such, and then you're actually getting some credibility to it and you're mm. speaking to somebody and you know that that event did occur. You can't necessarily verify what they're what they saw besides what they said, but exactly you're, under, you're understanding that this is actually documented. The police were even involved, so like the LBO case, for example. Yes. Right. Yeah. No. I, no without giving up your exact location, Kenny, how far are you from Palmyra, and do you ever plan on going to the area to investigate with a team or during the day by yourself? <laughs> I have uh, I have no qualms about it. So I'm in Maine. I'm in I'm in the Gorm area. So um, Gorms, that Rangeley, it's definitely within my within my commute and stuff like that for sure. And if I was gonna be able to get up there, I would like to try to at least be respectful and, and reach out to the new owners, I suppose. Before oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. Before you just like kind of <laughs> show up on the door. <laughs> yeah, the gonna... residents of the the Palmyra yeah. incident case back in. <laughs> it's a good way to get like a like well, Maine's like Texas and stuff and other places. I mean, a lot of people got guns up here. It's just a good way to have something, <laughs> something bad happen to you. That's all. Um, right. Shotgun to the face. Yeah, you know, you just might want to reach out to somebody. So we exactly we already, we already know the Martin story. Um, from what I understand, they're probably all set with talking about it anymore. I mean, it's already been documented it's been done by numerous people so the information that they knew they've mm -hmm. given out and as far as i know they've never had any updates so wherever they moved to and got away they've had no sort of further activity so i don't really think they would be worth interacting with i would think it would be the people that have invested in buying the property to see if they have had any sort of potential interactions um mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I would definitely like to, um, out of respect to, like I said, the residents, I did some yeah, research. Of course. I think I had the location, which I did forward on to Jody because I know Jody's actually been there. So mm. once once I'm able to actually verify that, then I can try to figure out, um, hopefully finding somebody that has a friend or something that lives there and then make, it, make a connection and then speak. Um, but, yeah, no, I would definitely – not really put myself in a, a situation without some uh, people that at least were able to be there with you for sure. Oh, for sure. Definitely. You definitely want to go out with a team of at least four people at oh, the yes. minimum just to have watching your six. So yes, yes, definitely. And going out with a firearm, just not just for dog man or Sasquatch, but you know, for your, just in general, bears, yes. your mountain lions. Yes. Yeah. Your, your predator animals that you see 
more often than you would a dogman or a Sasquatch. So, but no yeah. matter what, I, I mean, let's be real. Like, there's a a little stray cat outside. She's a kitten, but um, I mean, I I feed her and stuff, man. But dude, she can be vicious as heck, man. So, and that thing's like, it's still tiny, dude. But like, right. so now, now <laughs> you know, kill her. Yeah, you're, you're trying to put down food for her, and she's like. Or like wants to come at you you're like no here but so now imagine yeah like you said an, an actual apex predator so i mean even my pet squirrel oh, for sure dude so yeah oh yeah you, you, anything can you know especially if it has rabies that's a thing but you know you say you're in maine we actually do have some people in that are in the dogman community that i can get you in contact with i have a good buddy uh john miller he's part of the band uh devil driver He's the one of the bass players. He lives that in Maine. that used to be a uh, cold chamber, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I can't cool. think of his name. Uh, the lead singer, we, I, I met him back in March. I can't think of his name. Dez, Dez yeah, yeah, I can't cool. think of his Dez's last name, but yeah, yeah great cool. guy, super nice guy. But John, I get you in contact with him. I know he's all about the dog man, and yeah, and we also have Lee Buecher. I think he lives in Maine as well. Cool. He's actually the region three director. So if you'd like to get in contact yeah, no, with I him, mean, just. Being able to speak to anybody, um, you know, and definitely pick their mind and see, for example, what they think about um, what I've gathered and, you know, what I've been able to present. And it's always good to obviously fact check. Um, and oh, get for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And get corrected if you are incorrect about information. So and that's true. That's what we all just try to do is not not that, that we try to fact check people, but you definitely want to make sure that you're you have presenting to. something right. And, I mean, and it's not even like a way of a sign of disrespect i mean because someone that might be posting something might actually think that that was presented to them as authentic mm -hmm. but in actuality um it might not be so you have to like i don't know you just got to take it with a grain of salt sometimes yeah no you definitely do and that's the thing especially when it comes to the dog man <laughs> 20 years ago i mean it was linda godfrey was really the one that put the dog man on the map i would say what 30 35 years ago yeah, before it became the this big phenomenon, but I was I wouldn't say it really started gaining traction or popularity until, like you said, around when Vic started in 2015. And then all of a sudden, these reports start flooding in left and right. And then when Jody started up the NADP in 06, I mean, he was doing well, research on it. That see, that all makes sense though, too, if you if you think about it, because people again, that's a, that was a smaller community, so they're going to try to keep that tucked. Um, exactly tucked away and stuff like that so they're not going to necessarily reach out to people and at that point in time yeah, as far as i know there unless you were probably super rich i don't think a cell phone was accessible um <laughs> so, i mean you right. can't just you can't just call somebody um you'd have to write a letter go mail it to the post i, I don't know there, there's just so much that goes into the aspect that the reason now i mean with technology you can just hop on your phone click uh, a picture or something like that or click out information but back then you weren't really able to so it's going to be in a smaller area um mm -hmm. of uh, of the local communities and then the fact that it's 30 years ago yeah if, if, if people aren't paying attention to any sort of topic like that and it hasn't been brought up on a platform <laughs> that's considered i don't know credential based like uh mm -hmm. I, this is just an example i mean they've been caught supposedly saying stuff too but like history channel um you know if they're presenting something Okay, well, it's I'm gonna at least try to I see the the truth in this. But I remember, um, I I think it was Discovery Channel put out a documentary about finding um, mermen and women that had been eaten by a, like a great white shark, their weapons mm -hmm. in the stomach, and, and and people thought it was real. But then the scientist on the show was being invited to some sh like a morning show to speak about it, and he's like, "Hey, I'm just an actor." And I oh mean, wow. Yeah, you can uh, you can look that up. Uh, uh, Discovery Channel has actually been been slapped a couple times with like uh, prefabricating things about like the megalodon, uh, showing like an old picture from like World War II where they modified stuff. So, oh, it, interesting. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, it's very unfortunate because you would like to think, like I said, bigger platforms like that. But mm -hmm. usually, for the most part, I mean, if I'm watching, say, a documentary on a History Channel about dinosaurs, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty accurate, I guess. Because if I look up information from other paleontologists, I mean, it, it seems to match. So yeah, more credible people all tend to agree. But when you have two conflicting sides, it's like, well, how do you, you know, differentiate? What what side do you pick? You know, yes, do your exactly. own reading kind of thing, right? And then I guess. Keep an open mind to it, really. 
Yeah, no. And so I think that was a big issue. And I think once Linda Godfrey brought a little bit more light to it, um, people were like, wait a second. Okay. Well, this woman has credibility. She seems pretty, pretty normal. She doesn't, Mm -hmm. she even admitted she doesn't necessarily know if it's real or not as she's investigating it. So, so you have someone now that's coming in with a, I wouldn't like to say clear mind, but they're not coming in with a, Hey, this is, I don't know. It's like a fan for your sports team. I'm a Bruins fan. You're not going to tell me different that the Bruins aren't the best. You, you, you see what I'm saying? So, so you got yeah. that. But she was kind of coming into it with, okay, this is interesting. Why are these people seeing this? Um, why did that younger girl see it how uh, hunched over eating that uh, roadkill by the cornfield? Mm-hmm. Um, why were the why did they bulldoze that spot where there was a bunch of mutilated animal carcasses? Uh, things like that. So you're like, okay. Mm-hmm. And she, she presented that. And I think that's when I started getting a little bit more traction, I, I, I'd like to say. And, and, and I feel like that gave people, I don't know if I want to use the word courage, but uh, gave them the platform a little bit more to speak about things like that, like the, um, the LBL incident and stuff like that. And I uh, really put it out there. Um, and I mean, as much as we'd like to think our governments are here for the best of, of everything, I mean, if you just look back and fact check things we've done in history, we've uh, tested, you know, nuclear bombs on uh, other islands where these people are still to this day are dealing with like the pollutions and stuff. Um, exactly. We t- we tested mustard gas on some of our own soldiers um, out on a boat. So, I mean, again, we'd like to all think this, but for someone to be like oh you think the government wouldn't know about that my response would be like well you don't think the government would cover that up i mean look look at camp lejeune they allowed these people to bathe drink and and stay by polluted toxic water because they needed them for for soldiers Mm -hmm. so so again like like when people would say oh well the government would know i mean you can't really trust you can't just fully dive in and be like, Hey, everything the government says to you is true. Because I mean, there's, true. there's, there's numerous cases to prove it's not because the government would tell you, Hey, we didn't touch, we didn't test bombs in another country. Well, why does that government say, why is there a huge nuclear explosion here? For you? <laughs> yeah. And true. Just like if you use the UFOs, for example, the best thing to do is hide it in plain sight and then just say, this is what, what we see. Yes. So, I mean, and then and, now you see daily UFO reports of something yes. coming out, disclosure, I, you know. And I think when they first admitted that, um, it was, like you said, a very small little, it wasn't a public conference. It was just a, a kind of real quick. So, um, yeah, no, definitely, man. I, so I don't really, when the government says something about something, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Because, I mean, yep. look at the missing 411 and David Politis. Um from what I understand and from what he says is the national parks don't report the people that are missing. As I said to you, it's the loved ones, uh, the family members, that's where the publicity is coming from. So, I mean, it's not, for mm-hmm. example, like if you go missing in Acadia national park, they're not calling you. They're not calling the news being like, Hey, Kenny Thibodeau is missing. It's your family calling the news, calling the police, calling like the park, like saying, Hey, he was there the news being like oh okay well that that's kind of, that's how that information gets out there um mm. so when you look at the facts who knows where they're going but if you look at some of the really strange cases of where people go missing um steve stockton has a really great channel among the missing where he doesn't necessarily dive into some of the stuff that you and i are talking about he's just showing you these people have vanished and mm-hmm. uh, he does a really great job about that. And when you do look into some of the more interesting cases, um, like the gentleman I mentioned to you, it's super hard to say his last name, but Bart Schleisler, I, um, I totally probably butchered that, but that gentleman um, hunted and he was an animal activist mm-hmm. all across the world. So he h- had experience with big game, but people would bring him in to, um, tranquilize grizzly bears and uh, put collars on them to make sure that their numbers were doing good. Um, he was he was involved in Siberia tracking tigers uh, in their dens with their cubs while the mother was gone. Like 
Um, mm. We're talking about a, a we're talking about an individual that didn't get stalked by predators. He 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 stalked predators, um, and he just vanished in in the northern territory of Canada. And uh, they there's actually um, a great story. There's a couple great stories about that and about how the Canadian Royal Police just kind of brushed it off as like just a normal animal attack. But then they found his boat because uh, his friends went back to look, obviously. And then there was a bunch of more evidence found, like uh, something like cl- clothing that looked like it was ripped off and then just like bloody hair on his mask. But that was pretty much like what they had found. Um, mm-hmm. But there was no blood at the scene, um, no sign of struggle. And they did find a couple of bone fragments that matched him. But here, the seat he was sitting on was undisturbed. His weapon was never dis- uh, discharged. So that- Oh, wow. Okay. That, that's hard for me to think that he wouldn't have known a grizzly bear or a, a wolf was coming. I mean, there was obviously other signs of predators around the area. He's in northern Canada, you know. So, oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> but what would have been able to sneak up on him so quickly or catch him so off guard that he couldn't even dis- discharge his firearm or his bow or I don't know. It, it, it makes you think like, OK, and that's one of the more predominant ones. Um, he, he, he was a specialist, so that's why it's a head scratcher, whereas other people might just think one day, hey, I can go I can go hike from here to here and research and get lost. Like, we're not talking about that. We're talking about like a, a career lifelong outdoorsman that his family just said he just traveled all the time. That's what he did. Um, so that's like super interesting right there. And then some of the other cases uh, you and I spoke about, like Brenda Hamilton and um, yes, other- Cord Godsey even. Yes. Big head so, scratchers. I mean, yeah. And, and a lot of people might not know about that or may know about that. But yeah, they're, they're huge head scratchers, uh, large feral dogs. And I believe uh, the one with the little boy, they said that they found a pack of feral dogs living in an old mine shaft. <laughs> what? Um, <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cover up. <laughs> well, yeah, this is super interesting. And then same thing uh, with the whole LBL thing. Um, I mean... I've seen a bunch of good documentaries on it personally. Um, mm. I think Elijah Henderson, the two I watched by him, where he's actually found the locations and he can show you everything where it's been bulldozed. Um, he was the first one I saw, because I think it was like three years ago when he put that out that did mm-hmm. that. And that was awesome, in my opinion, because of how there was a site B, but also a site A, and they're able to figure out that this was the actual site and that there's only one site a and uh, i believe i had heard uh nick speak about it as well where mm-hmm. he had been down there and they had like planted new trees and things like that to covered it, it up <laughs> yeah it, so if you're not from that area or if you're not reading around you would just walk by that as if it it, it didn't exist um so that's super interesting too because that area as i sent you at the be- uh, beginning in that text Man, that there's a whole large area of unexplored or uninhabited. Yeah, let's let me read it real quick for people that aren't too familiar with the LBL. It's the whole geographical area. Let's see, let me pull it up real quick. You had said you sent it to me over 300 miles of undeveloped shoreline, 500 miles of trails, and 170 uh, 170 thousand acres of forest and open land. That's just the LBL. And, and and that's documented by their forestry um, people, and that's from their words. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, just think of that for a second. So, again, uh, Elijah Henderson had mentioned how he called the LBL about the camping uh, to be like, hey, what do I have to do to camp? So I thought that was pretty cool. And, hey, you know, I was like, all right, I'm going to see if I'm going to get a similar similar response to he what, what he got. And, again, I was told to get an online permit. I mean, keep in mind, I'm not in this area, but I, I can yeah. um, get an online permit. I was like, okay, other areas I should go to or big enough park. I'm sure you can find a spot. Okay, cool. And that was pretty much it. There wasn't really any sort of them asking me how long I was going to be there or any, any really interaction besides that. As long as I have my permit that shows that I've purchased this online in their system, mm-hmm. I can show up in camp. So, you know, what's interesting about that, though, is what, as I said, so what happens if you just something does happen and you just go missing? Now there's no unless you've told a family member your location, 
there's no documented area as to where you went. So, mm -hmm. okay, yes, he, he purchased his permit online, but we don't know if he showed up. Like, like there's no... Yeah. Because you're not calling them, show, being like, hey, I showed up today at 8 o'clock at this location. You've already spoke to them. They told you, just get your permit. That's it. Mm. So that right there is a little a little interesting because you would i don't know you'd like to think granted we're not talking about a campground but my little brother's got like an rv and he goes camping and i was asking mm -hmm. him about that and he says you know at campgrounds he goes to they tell you where you like the locations and stuff and what's available and stuff right yes yeah, so then you're like okay well we got this history of everything else that's kind of going on there and um now we have this and it's like wait a second okay that, that that's just an interesting just it was just an interesting phone call i i suppose yeah no i think that's a, really interesting that you were able to do that like you said being in maine and not you know we obviously you're a few states away from kentucky and tennessee yeah, so but... I, I couldn't get down there but I mean, that's the great thing with technology i can call any park and ask them like hey can i come yeah and, and stuff like that's that. one thing why we always try to recommend like you said earlier tell us a f loved one or a family member where you're going and what days to what days or buy one of those uh beacon locators and wearing on your person so if you do go missing they can at least kind of pinpoint where you're at the yes i mean there's so many missing cases where they found um you know for example those poor girls that went to ecuador i believe were just hiking they did end up finding their skeletons and stuff but because their mm -hmm. phone shut off they weren't able to find the exact location on the gps until way later um oh but, so like you said i mean you know yeah phone and stuff's good but if your battery sh craps the better or something like that um yeah and, and <laughs> from what I, I guess from what i gather gps's and cars and phones are accurate but they're not accurate to an extent not 100 percent accurate right yes yeah mm -hmm. so it'll give you like uh, iphone's gotten better at it but it's like when iphone uh track your iphone first came out it would give you like a radius of where your phone yeah, right? Right? it's like, More like a 40 mile radius yeah there's like three buildings here like what but now it actually shows you okay it looks like it's in this house and it's towards this wall okay like yeah yeah okay. iphones especially have gotten a lot better but those are my next question is since we're on the lbl topic uh do you believe it actually happened or do you think uh, I ask a lot of people this, it's just, you know, it's personal opinion. Do you believe it actually happened or do you think it was just something that was created just to get, you know, people talking about the area tourism possibly? Um, yeah, I, I, I do believe it. It happened because the uh, latter part of what you just said about for tourism, that would be mm -hmm. a terrible, terrible way to get um, something put on the map. I mean, the average person that's, not really looking for a thrill isn't going to bring their family to an area where even there's a story potentially like that. So I don't, I don't think that would be a good marketing technique. That's for sure. Um, True. Exactly. Yeah. That that's for sure. Um, the only but, reason why I asked that is just because I do have friends that live in the area and when, so I'm, I'm kind of more, it's more like 25, 75, but the 25% of the people I've talked to, some of them just think it was just made up and they just use it for, you know, publicity, the creepy pasta stories which, and stuff for online, you know, which now, like you said, um, I could see that now, but the, the original time frames are back when like Jody spoke to some of them, um, mm -hmm. back in the earlier two thousands and stuff like that. We're talking about before the, the crap storm, I guess, before the, I don't know, man, uh, most people probably didn't even have an idea about that really dude. That probably True. Was, that probably was just a again a local thing kind of like the um beast of bray road and until people brought it to a a proper platform to actually speak about it um i mean okay so jane thompson's been verified um, yes exactly the, the that's two, why i believe it happened too i just have to throw that question out there two, two police officers have uh you know been verified um Jody spoke to them. Other people have spoken to them. So these people existed. Um, they withheld that till their deathbeds, um, which tells you usually, I don't, I'm not an expert in death, but I would assume if you're speaking of something on your deathbed, it must be mm -hmm. of value because you have very little time left. So I would think you would be speaking of something that's either been affecting you or how much you love people, just something that matters. So for you to take those extra couple breaths or energy to speak is something like that that tells me that it obviously bugged you because it 
you weren't able to speak what really occurred. And if you did, you were ridiculed about it. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely do believe it, it. It happened. And I'd assume most people are probably pretty up to date as to what happened, but if they, they haven't, um, quick little summary is, you know, when the deputies showed up, the RV was ripped, bent, the doors busted off and it, they said it looked worse than like a horror movie than you could think that it was just horrible in there. Um, mm. So we're talking about a pretty messy, messy scene. And um, they said that there were scratch marks where it looked like something did have like an articulated thumb um, that was scratching down. And actually uh, another deputy that I had mentioned that to you, I believe it happened. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was um, Wisconsin where he showed up to that cabin that had been, um, supposedly vandalized where he said the slobber was above his head and also again the articulate is thumb um Cham- deputy chamberlain was his name i believe and oh all the, see, i didn't all know the, that that's something i didn't know yes uh he actually spoke about that on a monster quest about 20 years ago oh okay um, so you can actually see a documented aspect of him speaking about the story. Um, mm-hmm. but again, he showed up and said that um, er, that the front door, like the screen had been shredded. Um, the screen on the windows had been shredded. He said there was large claw marks down the side of the, like the cabin, the wooden cabin. But again, he said it looked like there was like an articulated thumb or something. And he said there was bloody slobber and slobber that was well above his head that looked fresh and still as if it had just recently occurred. And uh, he had to report the incident to the um, local uh, wildlife people that come in and, and they actually came to the scene and did collect unknown canid footprints. Um, so now that happened around the time. So the LBL thing too, but again, that gentleman just recently, I wouldn't say recently because it was 20 years ago, but he just told his story from when he was younger. And when he told the story, he's probably in his fifties. So it took him a while to speak about it as well. But again, the articulated thumb. So when you hear the other deputies, <clears throat> excuse me, speak about it, and then you hear that deputy speak about it again, when they hadn't communicated with each other, especially at that point in time, um, it's pretty interesting because it, 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 it's like before technology when indigenous people in America describe seeing Sasquatch and then indigenous people over in Europe describe seeing Sasquatch, but there was no way for them to communicate, but yet it looked the same. So exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it's for them to just have the very similar description um, as to a crime scene or whatever you'd like to call it when they haven't had a chance to speak is a head scratcher. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely believe the aspects of um, the dialogue that the officers had said about um, that the father's arm was ripped off, uh, his head had been ripped off, and I guess they did find unknown um, canid hair in his hand. And um, I guess there was a dog man that had been shot in the tree because from what I understand, one of the deputies thought his other deputy was wounded because he had blood on him, and he didn't. He was like, what? And he looked up, and there was a, a dead dog man that was sitting in the tree that had fabric in his hand. And oh, I, wow. I don't... I don't know the exact um, distance that they ended up finding uh, the girl in the tree, Mm. but um, I've read and heard a lot of people say it's in cases of finding mutilated animal parts up in trees. I guess she wasn't mutilated, but it's almost, it seems like a territory kind of thing. Like, screw you. Look what I did. Like, this is my, this is my spot. Like, we're going to put this right here and let you know this is what's happening. So, um, I guess after that was all kind of unfolding, uh, those two deputies were, as other people were showing up, were dismissed from the scene um, and told they're no longer working on the case. And I guess when they showed up at the local diner, um, that's when they interacted with uh, Jane Thompson and they were good friends. She said, I guess she saw them all the time and she Mm -hmm. could just see how like stressed out and just how screwed up they looked. And I guess that was one of the first times that she had had them actually speak that to them. So a lot of people might not know. I'm not going to get into too much detail, I guess, or or give 
too much of a platform to him. But Roger, um, <laughs> that has spoken, I guess, about his um, incident in the LBL, um, to me, what really, really, I guess, discredited that is um, mm. when he said that he got emotional. Oh, they're all lying. They're, those deputies are lying. He, he, he was saying that, yeah, people were dead, but they, it wasn't they weren't shredded so but they were dogmen that did it okay so a dogman is just going to gently break you and then set you down and i guess he said he hid underneath the rv up in the frame for like 15 minutes or so he he said i believe in quotes um but it was dark out and then he just jetted off and ran until uh, he saw headlights and it was a local farmer man if we are talking about what I believe is a flesh and blood animal, <laughs> it's going to hiding under an RV is not going to disguise like your body smell or any, and even if it did at that point in time, because maybe they were enraged by the other blood or whatever. So their senses, who knows? Okay. Within 15 minutes that they're, they're just going to have left that whole area. So you running down the street, <laughs> this dog man's not gonna, or these dog men aren't gonna. As I said, I'm not trying to give him clout, but also, no, I'm, I know, I, I totally understand. And like I say, it throws, I've talked about it before myself. I've, it says it just throws a whole wrench into the whole dog man LBO phenomenon. And I mean, he's a good storyteller, I could definitely say that. And for sure, for that, sure, that's something. And he had a lot of people convinced and believe, you know, which, that is. Which is, I, I guess, if you're a, a top grazer to the topic where you just kind of think like uh, unexplained things are cool and stuff like that, and you haven't really dove into it. I mean, I could see how by listening to him speak and stuff like that, that you might actually, or, or a viewer could take that as credible and stuff like that. But when you've, in my opinion, actually done the research and really spoke to the credible people like, uh, mm. like Jody and, and people like that that have actually been there with witnesses, it, their stories are a lot different than his and, and and again any sort of animal attack or if you want to say a sasquatch attack i mean uh look at port chatham i mean some people say it could be a dog man it could be a sasquatch but they were ripped apart so we're not talking <laughs> I, I don't know like they, they just wouldn't have laid you down all nice and you just wouldn't have been able to run down the road and be safe it's just not yeah bad. no i agree on that it's just you know if let's be real if if you're having an encounter with one of these things and they've just killed four other people and they want to kill you're not getting away yeah there's no way you just there's not no way yeah so for sure uh, you mentioned a couple minutes ago though you believe that dogmen are a natural creature or a flesh and blood creature do, yes do you want to do are you open minded to the possibility that they are interdimensional or oh of course i I don't, I mean, I don't even know if I can use the word specialized because I'm not a scientist, but I mean, I, I pay attention to uh, dogmen and stuff. So I'm mm -hmm. not, there we go, educated. I'm not educated enough on the paranormal aspects and things like that to, to, to form an opinion because I don't, I guess, invest enough of my time um, into that topic. I would say mm -hmm. my free time and my free brain power, I tend to invest into this topic at, at the time. Um, I used to be more, like pretty big into Bigfoot, but like I said, I feel like people have given me the answers that I, I felt like I was looking for when I researched. So that's kind of like a closed chapter to me. It's still cool. I'll still watch when someone puts oh, out for a, sure. a Bigfoot thing, but I would much rather when, when I see small town monsters uh, put out something about the dog, man, I, I watch that immediately. Whereas, I don't know, cool. The Bigfoot thing I might put on in the background when I'm working on some stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. It's, it's, it's been it, so mainstream for so long. Yeah, yes. So, but, um, yeah, no. So, I mean, of course, uh, again, like I said, I try to always look at things uh, subjectively and objectively. So, you know, uh, until someone actually can prove anything, I mean, it's all skeptical and, and stuff like that. But um, so just from the research I've done, though, when I when I think of what a living, breathing animal does and stuff like that, again, um I'm not educated enough in the paranormal to be speaking on that aspect, but 
uh, mm. from people I've spoken to and listening to stories and uh, reenactments and, and, and things like that. Um, there's footprints, which, okay, that's, that, that's a living or something physical, weight distribution, putting a footprint, um, a smell of blood and flesh and urine like dog piss well yeah because predators stink i mean smell the breath of a smell the breath of a crocodile or, or your cat that eats meat all the time you're like ooh, ooh kitty <laughs> you stink like like um you know what i mean or or, or like they're still an animal man cat piss yeah. like and stuff like that so now you have a physical smell mm. um they've been spotted eating things uh, needing to eat so again if you're if you're a live being you need to eat so they're they've been spotted chasing deer eating roadkill uh, uh you need a water source they've been spotted drinking water by water again which is mm -hmm. um point, pointing in my opinion towards that you're a living you're a living organism or a living being um scratch marks uh blood uh dna that, that has been collected so yeah pr pretty much all the things i guess i just spoke right there um is kind of why in my opinion, I look at it as more as like a physical, a physical being, um, like a woman I know that I had documented that lives up in, uh, the old part of the historical part of Yarmouth, which is near gray, super wooded, mm -hmm. but it's a nice area. Uh, she saw it, like chasing some deer across. So again, it's hungry. Like, why is it going? At, I mean, it could just be killing for, I guess, shits and giggles, but that's, most i don't know as far as i know or killing for sport possibly you think i mean it it could uh it, it really could be because um i've read about things recently where great white sharks um have been killing seals but they're not eating them it's like they're just biting their head off as if they're practicing or enjoying killing it, it was happening out in california a bunch and uh oh, a lot interesting. Of the, okay yeah so a lot of the marine biologists think that again i mean you're not going to have you're going to have, I don't want to use the word sick, but you're going to have animal personalities are different. I mean, some people can jump in and swim with this shark. And for some reason, this shark eats you. I, I don't know. Like it, it, So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely tough in, in that regard. Um, but, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. I mean, I watched a documentary about how octopuses, uh, certain species, take, the shells of the crustaceans they've killed and like fish bones and they, and they decorate the front of their cave like a and trophy it, almost right yeah yes yes like a trophy because they're happy what? so so yeah no totally with the the scenes where people have found um mutilated corpses of animals and things like that yeah it, it could be just for the sheer enjoyment of of doing it um because i have heard some documentation of hunters coming across um or even hikers or just people in general um, coming across animals that have been, so they're looking at it like, dude, what the hell? That's messed up. <laughs> yeah. And then they hear in the forest line or around them noises and they, and they claim they see the upright bipedal dog. So it's, it's as if they're set it, like not potentially setting the trap. Like you said, like, ha, 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 knowing that, it's, if they were hungry, they would have eaten that right there. Exactly. But they showing do. their intelligence almost. Yeah, of course. Which, in general, man, people people don't understand that animals are intelligent. I mean, my pet squirrel, dude, she, she knows when she's hungry, man. Like she she lets me know. She knows how to get into boxes, um, get into the peanuts and stuff, man. I mean, yeah, she can't speak, but she chirps up. She knows, hey, that's there, and I'm not gonna stop, like harassing you until you give me what i want <laughs> i would you know, have never believed that you had a pet squirrel until you showed me the, the evidence in the back yeah no she's uh sure she's, enough, kenny's got a pet squirrel <laughs> she's super cool man super cool um i i ended up saving her a little while ago uh, about maybe mm. two years ago and um she comes right in and hangs out with me and stuff like that but she loves being outside too so um yeah no cool. it's just a it's just a good example to show you because people Oh, animals are stupid. And, but when you spend time around animals and things like that, they're not stupid. Like they, they just don't have the same communication skills. Like an example, people are like, Oh, turkeys are stupid or deer. That's why they get hit. It's like, no, when nature created a turkey or a deer, there's nothing that goes as fast as a car with blinding lights 
that was in the equation. So, I mean, True. yeah, it stuns you for a second. That's why hunting like that isn't isn't allowed. You know, you're not allowed to shine lights into the field and and, and stun stun the animal because you're like, oh, like boom, like yeah, what's this? <laughs> that's also it, it's not that they're not stupid i mean that deer or that turkey survives outside with no heat no 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 like cold or fresh water sometimes like it's got to always get its own food i mean all the people that say they're stupid i'd like to see them try to go outside and like survive i mean i watched alone dude some of these people that are like yo i can do this they last like what 10 15 days man <laughs> at most but so so that's all I'm saying. So if animals weren't smart, they wouldn't be able to adapt and survive. We're talking about a different exactly. form of intellect. We think because we can type and write down mathematical equations, that's intellect. To an extent, it is. But building your own home out of forest parts, gathering your food, knowing when winter's coming, knowing how this predator's coming in, that's smart too, man. It, like They're just not using cell phones like you and I. Exactly. And that's the big thing. I mean, obviously we're more technologically advanced, but you know, we're almost coming up to the one hour mark. I, um, I have one last question I wanted to ask before we started wrapping things up. What do you think on dogmen cloaking? This is one I always like to ask people, what's your theory on, do you believe they can cloak or do you believe it's just pareidolia um, people are seeing or just. So you showed me some. Augusta good, wind. Um, you showed me some really good images where in my opinion, you can see that it's a, it, it's a physical black wolf that people report that they see it, it's there so um again i i don't know enough to kind of dive into the more supernatural part of it mm. i mean i would assume just like any predator um or even in some of the sasquatch videos it, it's gonna blend in with its environment so i mean it, it's it, yeah sure that's a form of cloaking i mean any sort of predator man i mean that's why people get attacked by a tiger dude when it's in the high grass it's, it's cloaking itself so i mean yeah yeah so of course uh, i mean i definitely think it's it's going to put itself in a situation where it's going to have the upper hand i mean if it knows hikers or, or, or people are coming up the trail and has an ambush point here i mean bears do that and stuff like that so that they do or just like octopi and uh, what is it? Chameleons that yes. can just tr blend into the surrounding area. So maybe it's camouflage. Maybe it's not cloaking, but I mean, cloaking is kind of a form. But no, 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 definitely. Um, I actually, I think it. I could be wrong, but I think it. Um, with wolves, that's what some of the younger ones in the pack do. They, they, they're, they're spooking the animal towards the, the actual killing or the more dominant wolves. So the younger ones, obviously, they're, they're, like a deer is going to run. It's still a wolf. But as yeah. they ch chase you, because they're not experienced yet, they're learning, they're pushing you into the experienced ones for the ambush, yeah. Oh, for sure, 100%. Well, brother, where, we just hit the one-hour mark. Um, I wanted to ask you, or where, where can people find you? Um, People can find me through you, obviously. Um, I mean, I have a Facebook page as well. I'm involved in uh, the three groups that you've accepted me and invited me to. Um. You can, uh, if you want to, at the end, throw up uh, or something in the comment section, my Instagram and my YouTube. Those are pretty easy ways to keep up um, as to what I'm doing and stuff like that. But um, also, you know, you can always shoot me an email and anything that works. I'm always open-minded and I'm willing to collaborate with people and learn knowledge. And yeah. Awesome. Well, like I say, brother, it's an honor to have you part of the team and have you be a field investigator for the North American Dogman Project. You too, man. You definitely got to create a talent. Love seeing your work. And, you know, we're excited to see you actually write the first newsletter. I would give no, that's, to... that's cool. I appreciate the opportunity. And I'm definitely, uh, like I said, uh, it just took me, uh, I've been wanting to do that for a while. But when you're creative, you get caught up. Like, I got some logos. Actually, when I'm done with you, I need to uh, work on for this woman. And uh actually daniel um wants me to do some stuff for his podcast potentially some oh, artwork right so yeah yeah so so there's always projects and stuff and then I, some of my friends are like hey you hopping on this game paladins we play later i'm like hey man i, I gotta do some other stuff right now that, <laughs> you're a busy guy <laughs> yeah man I, so so yeah no definitely um but i do um always try to you know take some time and and things that actually are of 
presentation. So that's why I sat down before we actually had this conversation. And I just dug through my brain, picked up all this loose paper that I just written stuff down and threw it over here. And I was like, all right, now it's on one file. I can update. I can send out. People want to know. This is the information I have. Actually, the gentleman that kept giving me the thumbs up, he keeps... It, 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 he's a cool guy he's funny but he, he yeah, asked me a few questions that i presented him my research because he had initially asked and then he re-asked the question and it's just funny because if you actually read my research the question you asked me i covered it in a whole entire section no i know in, the, in those 10 pages like i said you, like you did your research on it and it was phenomenal read if you don't mind could i share that to the Yes, five please. regional pages and post them on the North American Dog Man Project? Yes, man, please, dude. And definitely okay. uh, anytime. I mean, I'll still obviously be in touch with you pretty much daily. Oh, yeah, of course. And, and just because after an interview doesn't mean we can't stop. Yeah, no, obviously, of talking. course. <laughs> so, I mean, you're definitely my buddy and stuff like that. So, we'll, uh, you can definitely get me back on here anytime you want or anytime you have uh, questions about anything. And uh, I'll definitely, as things occur and update, I'll send them your way as well for sure. But, um, definitely always willing to collaborate and um definitely help you out and be a part of what you're doing as well even though i'm up on the east coast so hey hey just because you're on one coast and i'm on the other brother doesn't mean that's what i love about technology you're just a text away or a phone call away exactly. and vice versa you can always hit me up too yes no i appreciate it. that's so awesome yeah i'd like to say brother i'm honored to have you on the team and see what we're what endeavors not endeavors but what the future has for us and what we can do by starting with your media background and just everything, I, I like I said, I'm speechless and I can't wait to see what we have in the near future. Heck yeah, actually, uh, later tonight, sometime before I sleep, I got some other stuff uh, I'll send over to you. I'm actually going to try to do something like you said with Jody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to charge my phone for a few and uh, grab some food, but then uh, probably by tomorrow morning, I'll have some stuff for you to check out. So, All right, brother. Well, yeah, I appreciate you joining us on the West Coast Dogman Project. The Dogman Vortex podcast. I keep getting those two mixed up, but Dogman good. Vortex podcast. We're honored to have you on, Kenny. And maybe in the near future, like you said, maybe later on this year or next year, we'll have you back on and see what you've found in your research and see if you yeah, find course, some more man. evidence. And definitely uh, in the future, it'd be cool. You know, we potentially could link up and maybe find some uh, cool areas to kind of investigate and see what's going on. So, yeah, for sure, brother. Well, thank you again so much for joining thank us. And I hope you have a good evening, okay? You as well. Thank you, everybody. All Take right. care. Take thank care. Very much. Thanks. Later. Well, that was a great interview, everybody. Uh, you can catch us on our next interview next Thursday with Bigfoot Michigan Rob, where Todd and I will be interviewing him about his book that he just released last week. So we're looking forward to that interview. And then the week after, we have Heather Moser from Small Town Monsters. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Catch you on the next one.